evening. Welcome to Dhammasukha Meditation Center. This evening, Bhante Vimala Ramsey will be giving the Dhamma talk, Majima Nikaya number 59, the Bahu Vedaniya Sutta, the many kinds of feeling. <coughs> Thus have I heard on one occasion. The Blessed One was living at Sawati and Jetta's Grove, Anath and Pandika's Park. Then the, car the carpenter Panjakanga went to the Venerable Udayan. After paying homage to him, he sat down at one side and asked him, Venerable Sir, how many kinds of feeling have been stated by the Blessed One? Uh, the carpenter Panjakanga did a lot of work around there, so he got to listen to a lot of Dhamma talks. <laughs> I don't know. We'll have to ask him. <laughs> Three kinds of, been, of feeling have been stated by the Blessed One householder. Pleasant feeling, painful feeling, and neither painful nor pleasant feeling. These three kinds of feeling have been stated by the Blessed One. Not three kinds of feeling have been stated by the Blessed One, Venerable Udayan. Two kinds of feeling have been stated by the Blessed One. Pleasant feeling and painful feeling. This neither painful nor pleasant feeling has been stated by the Blessed One as a peaceful and sublime kind of pleasure. A second time and a third time the Venerable Udayan stated his position. A second and third time the Carpenter Panjakanga stated his. But the Venerable Udayan could not convince the Carpenter Panjakanga, nor could the Carpenter Panjakanga convince the Venerable Udayan. The Venerable Ananda heard their conversation. Then he went to the Blessed One. After paying homage to him, he sat down at one side and reported to the Blessed One the entire conversation between the Venerable Udayan and the Carpenter Panjakanga. <coughs> when he had finished, the Blessed One told the Venerable Ananda, Ananda it is actually a true presentation that the carpenter Panjakanga would not accept from Udayan. And it was actually a true presentation that Udayan could not accept from the carpenter Panjakanga. I have stated two kinds of feeling in one presentation. I have stated three kinds of feeling in another presentation. I have stated five kinds of feeling in another presentation. What are ki five kinds of feeling? I know you know. Do you know? Well, no, that would be six kinds. Five kinds of feeling. Dukkha, Sukha, Domanasa, Somanasa, Upeka. Painful physical feeling, pleasant physical feeling, painful mental feeling, pleasant mental feeling, and equanimity. Five kinds of feeling. I have stated <coughs> six kinds of feeling in another presentation. That's the feeling that arises at each of the sense doors. I have stated 18 kinds of feeling in another presentation. What are the 18 kinds? Oh, it's the six sense doors, painful, pleasant, neither painful nor pleasant. I have stated 36 kinds of presentation in another, uh, uh, 
36 kinds of feeling in another presentation. And that is the worldly and unworldly. I have stated 108 kinds in another presentation. Yes, with with the 36. <laughs> that is how the Dhamma has been stated by me in different presentations. <coughs> When that Dhamma has thus been shown by me in different presentations, it may be expected of those who will not concede, allow, and accept what is well stated and well spoken by others, that they will take to quarreling, brawling, and disputing, stabbing each other with verbal daggers. But it may be expected of those who concede, allow, and accept what is well stated and well spoken by others, that they will live in concord with mutual appreciation, without disputing, blending like milk and water, viewing each other with kindly eyes. Ananda, there are these five cords of sensual pleasure. What are the five forms cognizable by the eye that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire and inviting lust? Sounds cognizable by the ear that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire and inviting lust? Odors cognizable by the nose that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire and inviting lust. Flavors cognizable by the tongue that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire and inviting lust. Tangibles cognizable by the body that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire and inviting lust. These are the five cords of sensual pleasure. Now the pleasure and joy that arise dependent on these five cords of sensual pleasure are called sensual pleasure. Should anyone say that is the utmost pleasure and joy that beings experience, I would not concede that to him. Why is that? Because there's another kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than that pleasure. And what is the other kind of pleasure? Here, Ananda, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states. A monk enters upon and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied by thinking and examining thought with joy and happiness born of seclusion. That is the other kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than the previous pleasure. Getting in, into the first jhana. Should anyone say that is the utmost pleasure and joy that beings can experience, I would not concede that to him. Why is that? Because there's another kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than that pleasure. And what is that other kind of pleasure? Here, Ananda, with the stilling of thinking and examining thought, a monk enters upon and abides in the second jhana, which has self-confidence and stillness of mind, without thinking and examining thought, with joy and happiness born of collectedness. That is that other kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than the previous pleasure. 
when you get into the second jhana, you start to gain a lot of confidence. You start feeling like, I'm starting to get it a little bit. I'm starting to understand. And you feel yourself go deeper. Now, the second jhana is called the Noble Silence Jhana. It says that in the Samyut Nikaya, in case you're wondering. This means that you stop internal verbalization of making the wish. Now you just bring up the wish, feel it, and put that in your heart and radiate that to your spiritual friend. Should anyone say that is the utmost pleasure and joy that beings experience, I would not concede that to him. Why is that? Because there's another kind of pleasure loftier and more sublime than that pleasure. And what is that other kind of pleasure? Here, Ananda, with the fading away of joy, a monk abides in equanimity, mindful and fully aware, and still feeling happiness with the body, he enters upon and abides in the third jhana, on account of which noble ones announce he has a pleasant abiding, who has equanimity and is mindful. This is that other kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than the previous pleasure. <clears throat> there are some monks that will say that the first three jhanas are called the emotional jhanas. Because that you're, you're, you have equanimity in each of those jhanas, but it's not very strong. And it brings a little bit of excitement into the practice. The joy is very nice. And when you get into the second jhana, it's even nicer. And when you get into the third jhana, it's, it's, you still have the comfortable feeling in your body. As you go deeper into your practice, the feeling in your body starts to disappear. but it's still called part of the emotional body. This is like there's a bee that sees a flower and he walks around the outside of the flower and he's smelling it and he's becoming interested in it. That's like the first jhana. And then he starts going towards the center. That's like being in the second jhana as he's getting the pollen and whatever else he gets out of that. The third jhana is like he's coming out of that and he's very well satisfied. And the fourth jhana, which is not the emotional jhana, he flies off of the, off of the flower and goes home. So, Should anyone say that this is the utmost pleasure and joy that beings experience, I would not concede that to him. Why is that? Because there's another kind of pleasure loftier and more sublime than that pleasure. And what is that other kind of pleasure? Here, Ananda, by abandoning pleasure and pain with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, a monk enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure and purity of mind due to equanimity. Now when it says it has neither pain nor pleasure, what it's talking about is it doesn't make your mind shake. 
you, there can still be a painful feeling that arises, but you just let it be there. You don't get attached to it. This is that other kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than the previous pleasure. Should anyone say that this is the utmost pleasure and joy that beings experience, I would not concede that to him. Why is that? Because there's another kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than that pleasure. And what is that other kind of pleasure? Now, when the Buddha is talking about in the Eightfold Path when he's talking about right concentration, which I called harmonious collectedness. The definition in the suttas is always right concentration is the four jhanas. The fourth jhana has four different aspects to it. And this is where people get into calling it the fifth jhana, sixth jhana, seventh jhana, eighth jhana. Actually, they're just different parts of the fourth jhana. As you, your, your equanimity is the highest kind of feeling that you will experience. There's different degrees of equanimity that go deeper and deeper, but it's still equanimity. Should anyone say that this is the utmost pleasure and joy that beings experience, I would not concede that to him. Why is that? Because there's another kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than that pleasure. What is that other kind of pleasure here, Ananda? With the complete surmounting of gross perceptions of form. Gross perceptions of form. When, when you get to the fourth jhana, you don't have any feeling in your body except your head. And this is where you're radiating out. But when there is contact, you would feel that contact. It doesn't make your mind shake. It doesn't make your mind wobble. But you know that it happened. If somebody came along with a motorcycle or some, some kind of vehicle that made noise, you would hear that. But your mind wouldn't want to go to it. It's just, that's a sound, that's all. So the equanimity is quite nice when you get into this state. One of the things that many people that are practicing absorption concentration don't realize, and I've actually had people laugh at me when I tell them that it's what they're saying is not true, you can carry the fourth jhana with you while you're doing your walking. You can have strong equanimity. You don't feel your body except the bottom of your feet when you touch the ground and your head. And it's a little bit peculiar. But People that practice one-pointed concentration, they will tell you, no, that's impossible. You can't be moving around and be in that jhana. You can be moving around and be in any of the jhanas except neither perception nor non-perception. When you start doing your walking with neither perception nor non-perception, you go down into the nothingness of which even my my teacher Usila Nanda didn't believe until he actually could get to that state and see it for himself. You can be in nothingness 
and still do your walking meditation. When you get to neither perception nor non-perception, things are a little bit too subtle and you're not able to, to carry that with you when you do the walking. But people that practice absorption concentration, they quite often, they think that you can't be in that jhana while you're even in the first jhana. You can't be in any jhanas when you're walking. That's their belief. Of course, it's not true. And you will be able to be doing any kind of activity if you develop your mastery of going in and out of the jhanas. You'll be able to be doing any kind of activity and get into the first jhana. The advantage of that is the jhana is strong enough that you will not have hindrances arise in your mind. Now, these are the gross hindrances. So if you, you want to visit somebody in the hospital and they have a lot of pain or frustration or sadness, whatever the catch is, and you go in and you start radiating joy, they will feel that joy and their mind will start to come up to your level. And they stop hurting so much. Now this happens in the third jhana and this happens in the fourth jhana. I prefer to go in and radiate loving kindness with equanimity in my mind. Because when that strong equanimity is there, their mind has a tendency to get balanced and then they, they don't have um, so much pain distracting them. Their pain becomes less and less. <clears throat> okay, so we're getting back to uh, with the disappearance of gross perception of in sensory impact. In other words, you don't sit there and all of a sudden just feel some of your body. Your body isn't there unless there is contact. When there is contact, then the subtle perceptions can arise. Aware that space is infinite. A monk enters upon and abides in the base of infinite space. Now when you're practicing the way that I'm teaching you, when you get in, into infinite space, this is where the feeling of loving kindness changes. And it becomes compassion. Now, every day, the Buddha would get up after taking rest and he would radiate compassion to all beings in the world. And then he would survey the world and see who needed to talk to him and then he would arrange that. The Mahayana practicers, they talk a lot about infinite compassion. You have to develop your infinite compassion. But I suspect very strongly that what they're saying is you have to practice compassion with infinite space. that is something that should not be in there. That's why, you skipped over it. That's why I skipped over it. That is taken from the Visuddhimagga. 
understanding of things? Yes. You see, I, I've, I have some friends that are bivamsas, which means they've memorized about this many books, and they've taken a test on it. And the test is, I read a sentence to you, I tell you what sutta it is, I read a sentence, and you continue. And if you make a mistake, you only get six mistakes, and then you fail. So being a bivamsa is not an easy thing. My teacher, Usila Nanda, the year that he took the test, and there's, you have to be under 28 years of, old, of age. And he took the test, and that year he did not make a mistake. He was number one in the country that year. And it so happened that when I went to Burma, one of the monks that was staying at the meditation center that I was stay at, that I was at, he was the number one in the country in the year that he took the test. And he came to visit, and we had some good talks about the translation. And he uh, told me that there's quite a bit of the Vasudhi Maga still in this translation. And he encouraged me very much to take that out. <coughs> so that sentence is misleading. And I add the word gross perception because just perception is misleading. And that implies that you're in absorption and your mind is really absorbed. And uh, you don't feel your body at all. Your mind is so absorbed. But when you're practicing twim, <laughs> tranquil wisdom insight meditation, it's a different kind of meditation where you still have awareness of things around you. Your mind is not so over-focused on just one thing. <coughs> Excuse me, yes? Does anyone ever point any of those uh, concentration uh, meditators ever point out what they learn from focusing on one thing? No, they're just into the attainment. Yeah, that's what I mean. They, they never pointed out that because they some of them saying that they say focus, they can see one thing and everything. Well, the thing with with uh, absorption concentration is if you make up your mind before you go into that state that you're going to see something, you can. Um, no, no, no. There's no seeing. Right. And uh, they're in the uh, 19-teens, I think, or 1920, somewhere around there. There was a, a couple of people that were really into deep absorption concentration. And they wanted to see if there was anything smaller than a molecule, because that's what they, they had heard was the smallest thing. And they not only saw atoms, they saw electrons and neutrons, and they even saw quarks, and they described them in their language of that time. So you can, you can direct your mind to see some things, but you don't see how the process works. And that's what the real problem is with the absorption concentration. Because the force of the concentration suppresses the hindrances and the hindrances are where your attachments are. 
So you keep on taking your attachments to your object of meditation and you're forcing those down, but you don't learn about dependent origination when you're practicing that. Okay? Should anyone say this is the utmost pleasure and joy that beings experience, I would not concede that to him. Why is that? Because there's another kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than that pleasure. And what is that other kind of pleasure? Here, Ananda, by completely surmounting the base of infinite space, aware that consciousness is infinite. A monk enters upon and abides in the base of infinite consciousness. This is that other kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than the, than the other pleasure. So when you get into when you're practicing the Brahma Viharas, when you get into infinite consciousness, the feeling of compassion disappears and the feeling of joy appears. This all happens by itself. You don't have to make it be there. Okay? It does it on its own. You'll get to a place where all of a sudden your mind becomes very peaceful and calm. And then you'll feel this kind of joy. Now this isn't the same kind of joy that you felt before. This is a not excited kind of joy. This kind of joy is like the awakening factor of joy. This is called the overflowing kind of joy where it just kind of, you just feel happy, you feel good. Now with this kind of joy, there can be some strange things that occur. One of the things is you'll be sitting and that joy is there and it's very comfortable and you feel very good all over. Everything just feels great. And then your eyes pop open. And it's, uh, that's interesting. So you close your eyes and your eyes pop open. Wow, wonder what's doing that. I'm not doing it. It just happens. Close your eyes, your eyes pop open. Okay. Now, a lot of the Buddha images that you see, they, they'll show you that his eyes are half open. What the artist is trying to show you is he was experiencing this kind of joy. <coughs> the all-pervading joy. And you don't focus on anything, you just leave your eyes open and stay with the joy, radiating that to all beings. And while you're sitting, you can notice if your eyes pop open, you can notice at the eyes or the ear or the body or mind. I didn't notice, I didn't say nose or tongue because you're not tasting anything at that time, you're not smelling anything at that time, really. So it's not going to come up. But it can happen at, at any of the sense doors and it's, it's like blinking very, very quickly. And, and it's like seeing a movie that's going a little bit too slowly and you see each one of the pictures but it's it's happening quickly 
Now you're seeing individual consciousnesses arise and pass away. Now the thing with this particular realm is that you start realizing very deeply that everything is changing. And because there is this continual change that's happening, that's a form of suffering. It's a disturbance, really. And you see very personally that there's nobody home. There's no controller over this. It happens all on its own. Now this is this is a deep insight because now you're seeing that everything is impersonal. Everything is changing all the time even though in your regular consciousness you think that when you see something it's just one continuous sight. But now when you get to this level of collectedness you're seeing that it's just flashing little tiny things flashing on and off on and off on and off you're seeing birth and death birth death birth death birth death birth death and you're seeing how impersonal all of this is because you couldn't do that on your own right you can want to do it on your own, but it doesn't work so well. So, <clears throat> you're seeing the characteristics of all existence. And, when you get to this level, you're, you're actually pretty familiar with the links of dependent origination. You're pretty familiar with how the feeling arises and craving arises and all of the rest. And you're able to start developing more and more quickly the release, relax, release, relax, smile, release, relax, smile, come back. And it starts happening on its own a little bit at this stage. It gets better as you go deeper. <coughs> Should anyone say that this is the utmost pleasure and pain that beings experience, I would not concede that to him. Why is that? because there's another kind of pleasure loftier and more sublime than that pleasure. And what is that other kind of pleasure? Here, Ananda, by completely surmounting the base of infinite consciousness, aware that there is nothing. A monk enters upon and abides in the base of nothingness. This is that other kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than the previous pleasure. When you get into nothingness, mind stops looking outside of itself. In other words, the six sense doors don't really uh, pull your attention to them. Unless there's contact, of course. But now you're starting to see how mind actually starts, begins to work. And the feeling of joy changes to a strong feeling of equanimity. <coughs> Excuse me. This has always been kind of interesting and this is how I recognize when people are in that jhana, in nothingness, because your mind just doesn't get excited about anything. It's just, how you doing today? 
fine. Everything is fine. Your voice has this real strong balance in it. And there's no excitement about anything. Now, this particular state is very interesting because you'll get to a place where it's like being on a tightrope and if you put too much attention into your staying on your object of meditation, your mind starts to get restless. If it's not quite enough attention, your mind starts to get dull. So now is when you get to fine-tune your energy and just little tiny adjustments. Nope, that wasn't quite enough. I need a little bit more. Now in the Samyut Nikaya, it talks very much about uh, sloth and torpor and what you need to do with sloth and torpor. And it also talks about, in another part of the suttas, it talks about restlessness and what you need to do with restlessness. Now, when you're when you're starting to realize what the awakening factors are, the first three awakening factors: mindfulness, investigation, and effort. When your mind is a little bit dulled out, you need to investigate how is that happening and add a little bit more energy. Then there is joy. When you hit that balance, joy arises. On the other side, when you have restlessness, then you can bring up tranquility, stillness, and equanimity. When you bring one of these up, then your mind starts to get in that balance again, depending on what you need. <coughs> Now we had a discussion with one of our one of the students in Indonesia and they were saying too much and that's not quite right if you have too much effort too much equanimity you're going to get restless if you have too much tranquility or stillness you're going to get dull but they forgot about the last two factors and there's no such a thing as too much mindfulness or too much equanimity. Now, when you get to a certain place in your meditation, I might suggest that you use one of the awakening factors as the feeling and you stay with your equanimity and you use that feeling get into the feeling of having a tranquil mind or get into a feeling of having a still mind and that can help put everything in balance when the equanim when the uh, awakening factors are in perfect balance. That's when you attain Nibbana. So sometimes it, it <coughs> by talking with you I can see that your mind isn't quite still enough. So I'll say put some stillness with as you're feeling with your equanimity. Bring up that feeling of stillness and radiate that with your feeling of equanimity to all beings. Now, 
when you first started, when you got to the fourth jhana and I started telling you to do the six directions with metta, with compassion, with joy, with equanimity, you still do that. But I'll tell you to cut it down a little bit. So instead of five minutes, it might be three minutes or one minute, something like that, depending on your situation. Now the reason that it's important to radiate to all of the six directions is so that your mind will gain the discipline of you just want to point it in that way or that way or whatever. And that that discipline is is something that will help all the way through. And then radiating it to all beings in all directions. That's what you do the rest of the time. When you get into the realm of nothingness, there's all kinds of interesting things that can occur. And I'm not going to tell you about it. You have to tell me about it. But it, it gets to be kind of fun. <laughs> so, <coughs> it gets to be exceptionally interesting. And that's why it's fun. And you'll be able to see when your mind starts to wobble or waver, you'll get to see that more quickly and you 6R and your mind just stays right there. But there's something that happens before your mind wobbles. Some kind of distraction starts to arise. I want to know what that is. You can't tell. <laughs> I don't think you ever mentioned the answer as far as I can tell them. I have. We we did it one summer and you put it on and I had to get you to take it off. You never found it, did you? Oops, we didn't have it. You never did. It's still out there. <laughs> you didn't take those off? Well, I took off something. Uh, I think it's when our boyfriends from Chicago came. It wasn't a good time. Uh, <coughs> should anyone say that this is the utmost pleasure and pain that pleasure and joy that people experience, I would not concede that to him. Why is that? Because there's another kind of pleasure loftier and more sublime than that pleasure. What is that other kind of pleasure? Here Ananda, by completely surmounting the base of neither perception nor non-perception, a monk enters upon and abides in the base of neither perception nor non-perception. And this is that other kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than the previous pleasure. And this is quite interesting. This is when you'll start sitting for longer periods of time you have l the equanimity that you had will fade away. You'll get into a state that's like being asleep and being awake or aware at the same time because it's very subtle. At first, 
you're kind of aware but not really when you come out of that state that's when you reflect on what happened while you were in that state and anything that you saw while you were in that state you need to use the six R's and let it go it's colors, it's shapes, it's patterns, it's all kinds of interesting things. As you become more familiar with that state, your awareness becomes much sharper. And you don't have any real object of meditation because the equanimity is too coarse. So now you take mind as your object of meditation. And this is not just the regular mind. It's this very pure, quiet, subtle mind. And you'll be able to sit for a period of time and then you'll start to see little disturbances start to come up. And as soon as that happens, by the time you get to this state, it should be pretty automatic that your mind just recognizes that there's some movement or vibration and relax. You'll be able to sit for 45 minutes, an hour, an hour and a half without any disturbance at all. And this is a state that I have to warn you, just because nothing is happening, I don't want you to get up. Your mind is at its purest ever, because there's no disturbance in it. If there's no disturbance, that means there is no craving. So your mind is exceptionally pure and bright, and you use that pure, bright mind as your object of meditation. <clears throat> Should anyone say that this is the utmost pleasure and joy that beings experience, I would not concede that to him. Why is that? Because there's another kind of pleasure loftier and more sublime than that pleasure. Now, the, in another one of the suttas, the Buddha was talking about uh, neither perception nor non-perception. And Ananda said, if, it's, it's really true that if you have to have an attachment, this is the best attachment you can have. And the Buddha agreed with him. You can still get attached because it's it's very pleasant to sit without any disturbance in your mind to speak of. <coughs> now this is where some of the students in Malaysia or Indonesia they would say their mind was so strong with equanimity, it was so balanced. And then that equanimity would fade away and they would they would just tell themselves, you know, it really doesn't matter what happens after this. This is something. There's no desire for, quote, Nibbana to occur. Whatever's going to happen is going to happen. That's the kind of mind you have to develop. And what is that other kind of pleasure here, Ananda, by completely surmounting the base of neither perception nor non-perception? A monk enters upon and abides in the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness. This is that other kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than the previous pleasure. Now, when you get into this state, you don't know you're in the state. There's no perception, there's no feeling, there's no consciousness. It's just blink, that's it. Somebody's switched off the power. And you can be in that period for a 
period of time, maybe five minutes, maybe an hour. But you don't know you're in that state until you come out of that state. When you come out of that state, your mind is very alert. Your mind is very observant. And then you start to see the individual links of dependent origination and how they arise. And then you see how they cease. And when you see that, and it happens fast, you might rec not recognize it at, right at first, but it's that does happen. When you see that, it is such a deep, deep insight that your mind goes, oh, wow. And that's when Nibbana occurs. And we have, have had some discussions about Nibbana. Don't know how to talk about it. It's an unconditioned state. There's no concepts there. There's no way to describe it. When you come out of that, you feel like something really special has happened and you feel major relief. And it's quite a nice feeling. And it lasts for a few days or a week or a year or however long. But the, this feeling of relief, of finally waking up, You've been in a slumber. You've been sleeping for how many lifetimes? Thinking that everything that you see is a continuous sight. Or hear is a continuous sound. Or feel, or you feel like it's, it's uh, you feel like it's part of yourself. And that is a false belief. Because when you start seeing the individual consciousnesses or you start seeing the individual links, there's no way that you know you could control that. It just happens because the conditions are right for it to happen. And there's so much relief in that, that it changes your whole perspective of life. Changes things. Because you start really to understand how this process does work. It is possible, Ananda, that wanderers of other sects might speak thus. The recluse Gotama speaks of the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, and his disciples are, and, and he, he describes that as pleasure. What is this and how is this? Wanderers of other sects who speak thus should be told, friend, the blessed one describes pleasure not only with reference to pleasant feeling, rather, friends, the Tathagata describes as pleasure, any kind of pleasure, whenever and in whatever way it is found. That's what the Blessed One said. The Venerable Ananda was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Now, sitting in the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, there's an awful lot of relief. There's even more relief than in 
neither perception nor non-perception. It's kind of like blinking out and just having nothing. Your body is still has its heat and its, its uh, vitality and the six sense doors are still there and they're available whenever they whenever you get out of that state but when you develop your meditation to such a degree and you become an anagami, a person that gets into the third stage of awakening, you can make a determination to sit for a period of time. And when you're retired, you can do that about any time you want. But if you have time and you say, oh, well, I've got three days here, nothing really is going on, I'm just going to sit for three days, and you sit in the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, you can do that up to seven days. If you try to do it any longer than that, your heat dissipates, your vitality disappears, and your body becomes like a dead log, or like a log. <laughs> you, you will die. Uh, well, that's what determinations are real big on. Uh, a lot of people, I can teach mastery in the, in the determinations. It takes a little bit of practice, it's not not much of a big deal because by the time you're able to do it you have developed your mind enough that it it catches on pretty quickly but it's like uh, when you start out on mastery I would tell you to go in to the first jhana for somewhere around 15 minutes and don't make it exactly 15 minutes every time change it by a few seconds one way or the other and then come out at the time you determine so you, you're sitting and you can sit for 14 minutes and 53 seconds and exactly at 53 seconds where you said I'm going to come out then you come out and you look at the clock and you go yeah that, that's right and you get to hit it without missing and then you stretch it out to a half an hour and then you stretch it out to an hour once you're able to hit at the hour then I want you to go in and out of the first jhana in four seconds and when you're able to do that with your determination for however long you determine, then you do it with the second jhana. And then you do it with the third jhana. And you do it all the way up to nothingness. You can do it with neither perception or non-perception, but that takes some real practice. Once you're able to do that, you can make a determination that you can go in and out of the jhana anytime you want. And that's when you start developing the ability to go in and out of the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness for however long. Uh, when you let's say you sit for six days and five hours and 21 minutes and five seconds. When you come out of that state, there is no stiffness in your body and you have your mind is so pure 
that you have such radiance about you that people will look at you and go, wow. When anybody does that, it's to your best advantage to give them something. Offer them food, offer them water, offer them anything you have because the merit of doing that is quite good. There's a story about a man that just, he, all he had, he was very poor, all he had was water and he was a farmer and he offered his his lunch, that was his only meal of the day, to Sariputta had just come out and then they looked at his field and his field turned into solid gold. Uh, that uh, it could be accurate it could not I don't know but it's the the whole point of it is it's good to give somebody when you see them and and you you'll recognize their their features are very very clear and very very bright and you see these halos around all of the saints well this is his whole body it's pretty amazing so, got a question? I think the problem with this uh, scenario is that you're never going to know. If you're looking for somebody to give a gift to, you person. Well, stick around here long enough, kiddo. <laughs> well, yeah. Oh, he was sitting after breakfast and he missed lunch, and uh, that was yesterday. And he's still there. Oh. Oh, okay. They are playful little guys, aren't they? And where's Dad? You'd think he'd be around somewhere too. Anyway, let's share some merit. <coughs> May suffering ones be suffering free, and the fear-struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we've thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty powers, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddhist dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.